Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tim Spencer sitting in for John Moore today. Apparently he had some business to attend to. Today is Friday the 13th. That's Friday, December 13th in the year of our Lord 2019. Uh, following on with John's tradition, uh, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, <clears throat> well, folks, we have our special guests on the line, Mr. Tom Berryhill. We're going to talk about emergency radio communications. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Tim. How are you? I'm doing good, buddy. I'm doing good. Hey, did you happen to see the results of the British election last night, the UK election? No, I didn't. I, I just uh, I came in a little bit late. But anyway, no, no uh, the Tories or conservatives the- just absolutely walloped the communists. Uh, I mean, they are what they call Labor Party. They're communists, just like our Democrats are becoming or are. But they, I mean, it was like a Trump landslide. He, his people just took almost everything. They took 60 seats away from uh, the Labor Party. So, I mean, it it is an unbeatable majority. Are they contesting the outcome yet? No, they won't. They won't. Uh, they're allowed to watch the count and all that. So I don't think they'll contest anything. You know, but it's done on paper ballots like it should be done here. And, yes, I you know, agree with that. They count, they count them up right. And, uh, no, I don't think there will be any contesting whatsoever. But uh, we know one thing for sure, Brexit's going to happen by the 31st of January. So, <laughs> and uh, it's going to be interesting. Yes, it is. So, yes, it is. I think it's going to be great, actually, for, for the people of the United Kingdom. I really believe that. But anyway, uh, we're here to talk about emergency radio communications uh, where do you want to go, Tom? Uh, I mean, it seems like when John wants me to fill in, it's usually on a Friday. Uh, and I've asked you about every question I've had over the years. So where would you like to go? Well, we talk about entry level uh, okay. to ham radio. And everybody uh, that's listening that's interested should definitely check out the American Radio Relay League, ARRL.org. They have all types of publications that will uh, that will bring you in at an entry level. And they have they also have books and information at the uh, very high uh, technical and engineering level. In fact, some of their books are used in engineering courses at universities. So uh, they have it all. They 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 have everything that you would need to get started, and then uh, you can take your your education in uh, radio to as high of a level as you'd like to go. So uh, they're a good place to start. That's how I started all those years ago, and other publications are still some of the best. There's a lot of websites. Of course, we didn't have that in the old days, but there's websites out there that have have the test, online testing. You can take the test and continue to take it until you get to the point where you're getting passing grades and I think that the, that just doing that along with your study guides, I really believe anybody could pass that test in uh, about three weeks or so. They just gave it some uh, some good effort. So that's that's where you would well, start. And then Tim, I get a lot of questions all the time from new hams, especially ones that just got into it, setting up antennas and. They're buying antenna tuners. When I started, nobody had antenna. We didn't use antenna tuners. We, right. Some of us didn't even. We didn't even know what reflected power was. You, you know, we used light bulbs. Touch it in to get a fluorescent light bulb near the antenna. If it lit up brightly, when you push that telegraph key, that was good enough. 
had no idea how much power was being radiated, didn't know about uh, uh, reflected standing wave ratios and, and all of that. So that all came later, and I've studied it for right. years. But it, you don't have to know all of that. You can start out very simple and learn as you go. One thing... Uh, oh, that... Go ahead, all I was going to say was, Tom, that, that that's what I did. It wasn't on ham. It was on other radios, but... I'm completely self-taught, and I've set up some amazing systems. Uh, you know, so yes, you can absolutely teach yourself. Yes, you can, and the information's out there. And there, and a good investment, I believe, for ham radio operators is some basic test equipment. That's really important to have because you're going to need to measure voltage, current. You'll need to measure uh, frequency, perhaps. You might uh, want to measure modulation levels. The all-around uh, test set for that would be a communication service monitor. They get kind of expensive. That's what I use. But right. at a minimum, I would ha- I would have, uh, and I don't I would have a digital voltmeter, but that wouldn't be my primary ent- uh, instrument for checking everything. I use a Simpson 260 voltmeter. It's an analog voltmeter. It's a it's a pretty good unit. They've been made for decades, and it's right. it's the it's the go to voltmeter. It's really handy because when you have a moving needle and you're making adjustments, you need to see that that uh, needle move. Now, some digital voltmeters will have a bar graph on them, and that that can work as well. I'm just personally used to using that uh, analog uh, meter with the moving needle. If you're adjusting right. circuits uh, for peak output and things like that, uh, that needle really comes in handy. And it's just something, it's a good thing to have. So if you can afford to have two voltmeters, make sure that one of them is uh, an analog meter. And you don't have to invest a, a lot of money in this. There's even some uh, import Chinese-made meters that are analog that will take care of that uh, requirement as well so you don't have to spend tons of money a digital voltmeter sure. you could purchase one of those for i've seen them at harbor freight for six or seven dollars and then you could have a an analog meter probably around the same price range so you'd have a very minimal investment you can always increase your capabilities and and accuracy of your measurements as you move along you get better equipment and if you if you have the funds to do it I would purchase a communication service monitor, and a lot of them, well, all of the newer ones will do, will monitor single sideband as well, but the uh, old, not all the older ones did. I have um, three of them that I use, and they all will monitor single sideband as well as AM and FM. So this is how you can calibrate your equipment. These service monitors are, are a calc, very highly calibrated instrument. They have an oscilloscope on them. They have a voltmeter. Right. Well, now some of these uh, uh, monitors uh, you can actually get, if I remember correctly, from uh, like DRMO auctions uh, and and stuff like that, the military-grade ones. I believe I've seen them at some of those auctions. Well, that's that, a lot, and the reason I'm even going there, Tim, is a lot of the newer hams, they uh, they're putting on VHF. When they first get on, they put on two meter and 450 megahertz uh, UHF systems. And I uh, I was at a I went to a one of John Moore's uh, uh, meetings in uh, Rolla once and did a a little bit of a presentation there, and there were some ham operators there, and the one guy was the president of their radio club, and he's an electrical engineer, and I was talking to him afterwards, and he was telling me how they he adjusted the repeater and the repeater duplexer, which is a very uh, sophisticated, it looks simple to look at, it looks like some pipes with adjustments on it, but they're, they have to be calibrated exactly. He had all kinds of problems, and he said he tuned this. He tunes theirs by ear. He listened, and I was speechless, Tim. You you can't really 
accurately tune those things by ear. It's it's uh, you're dealing with some very low power levels. See, a duplexer allows you on a repeater system. It allows you to have one antenna, and you transmit into that antenna, and you receive the distant station talking back. You receive them coming back through the same antenna at the same time. So it lets the transmitter power go out to the antenna to be radiated to distant stations, but it also allows that very sensitive receiver to hear those weak signals from the mobile units that could be many miles away. It allows them to be heard on a, a different frequency at the same time. And so without being interfered uh, with by the, the system transmitter. So the repeater transmitter won't blow out or, or interrupt or interfere with its, its own system receiver, and it can operate simultaneously on the same antenna. Um, I've worked on right. some high-power repeaters. You had uh, 100 w or in excess of 100 watts going out to that antenna through this duplexer, but you never even knew it was on the air with the receiver. It's just sitting there in a steady state ready for a signal to come in, and if it receives a signal, even a very weak signal, was not overcome by that transmitter. So those have to be accurately calibrated. This is what a lot of hands do. They're, they're tuning these things. They're new to it. They don't understand how it works. They think they do. They maybe found a website that said, uh, do it like this, and they're trying to do that. And I've had several uh, ham operators bring their repeater systems to me or ask me to come and work on them. Uh, because the, somebody tinkered with the adjustments, and every little adjustment in there is very critical. And some of them, they uh, they work together. You t you turn one a little bit, you have to go back and retune the one behind it. You go right. back and forth until you get the best adjust. It takes a sophisticated instrument like that to do it. So I think uh, it's a good idea if somebody's really interested in working on, especially repeater systems and uh, VHF and UHF radios, which is what most new hams get into. They start at the uh, two-meter uh, level, which is 146 megahertz. It takes equipment like this to calibrate those units. So um, they're getting more expensive, uh, uh, inexpensive, I should say, on eBay. I've seen some of the older service monitors go for just a few hundred dollars, two or three hundred dollars. Uh, some of those were Cushman. They were made by Cushman. And um, some of the older Motorola units will do all of this, and I've seen those go for just a few hundred dollars as well. And I use IFR uh, systems, which is um, they're made in Wichita, Kansas, and they're a little bit more expensive. But I have a very small one, and this is really a good one for the for the beginner if they're just getting into it. It's an IFR 500A. It's a very small, compact unit, and it, it lacks some features that are really handy in a laboratory setting, but for out in the field, for service work, it will do a, probably about 95% of everything you'd ever encounter. And for the average ham operator, it will do most likely 100% of what they would ever need. It will do uh, AM, FM, single sideband. You can monitor uh, off the air, so you can actually use it as a receiver and listen to any frequency, I right. think from about two, 250 kilohertz to one gigahertz. So it covers all the short wave bands, and it, since it does single sideband, you can actually use it for your HF systems and listen uh, to your single sideband signal, uh, monitor the power output. It has just a lot of functions, so there's, uh, there's a lot you can do with these things. I've had uh, emails from people that have listened to the show and they wanted to know what type of equipment was needed to calibrate their radios and, and how to make adjustments. And so th this is uh, this is one uh, piece of equipment that would allow you to do just about everything you'd ever need. Okay, Tom, hang on there a minute. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in three minutes. 1-800-313-9443. Give us a call.
back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tim Spencer sitting in for John Moore on this Friday the 13th, the 13th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2019. Uh, we're visiting with Tom. We're talking about ham radio communications, having a good time doing it. Folks, if you have any questions, give us a call, 1-800-313-9000. Four, three. They want to try to keep it related to ham radio if we can for the rest of the hour. Okay, Tom, you're on, buddy. Where do we want to go? Well, we're, we've covered uh, the test equipment pretty good, and, and yeah, at a minimum, I, I at a minimum, I think uh, ham operators they should have uh, a digital voltmeter, an analog voltmeter. Basic hand tools, soldering equipment, and then uh, they can go from uh, from there. If they should have uh, a signal generator, some sort of a watt meter, and then uh, if they want to go all out, they can get one of these communication service monitors I was just describing, and that would be enough to really do a lot of testing. And if they're going to uh, calibrate or adjust equipment or or check antenna systems, anything like that, it's really really handy. To have this type of equipment. Sometimes a club will, a ham radio club will actually purchase one of these to keep for all the members to use. So that's a good thing as well. Oh yeah, I agree. Yeah, I've I've got to get going on my ham radio skills. I I can do UHF, VHF, ultra low frequency, uh, but I've never gone for the ham license. I've just done it and had my FCC licenses for you know, uh, actually being able to transmit. Uh, but those you just buy. You don't have to have any skills to do it. But uh, I think maybe this winter when it gets too cold for me to go outside, I think I might just pursue getting my ham license. Uh, just out of curiosity, Tom, what's it cost uh, once you pass the test to get a ham license? Well, Tim, the last time I took a ham radio test, was in around October of 74, and that's when I got my extra class license. I don't All right. I don't know. If, I, don't, I haven't taken a ham test since then, and I took uh, right. a, commercial, a commercial. I have a commercial FCC license also, and I took all those tests about that in that same time frame. I took my first one in 67, and then uh, again in uh, 68, and then I took... Another test in 71 that got me the advanced class, and then I went to the extra class in 74. By the way, that extra class test back in those days, we had to draw schematics and things like that. And I remember uh, they had a partial diagram of a power amplifier. It was all tubes. I I don't think they had anything that was a transistor. So the tests were kind of old. They were old, getting outdated even uh, in those days. There's still a lot of tubes used, but remember they uh, asked about where would you put a uh, neutralization capacitor in this power amplifier circuit. You had to actually draw it in, and right, it was uh, it, the the extra class test in those days. I felt was harder, much harder, and more complex than the uh, the uh, first class radio telephone license, which was also difficult to get. But uh, the ham thing was was uh, very difficult, and they've really scaled it back. So you can go, I mean, I hear of guys going into to their first testing session, they get their technician license, they get their, excuse me, then they get their other, uh, their other licenses all at once in one setting. Okay. I just looked up here, it says, on uh, one one website, hamradioprep.com, and it says the total cost for testing and the license and all that is $40 for a technician license. Yeah, I didn't know because uh, I've never really gotten involved with the test side of it ever since, uh, you know, I, I took the extra in 74. Uh, things have changed so much. i tell you the truth, Tim, I don't know if I could pass the test today. The technical side... I don't think I had too much trouble with, but it's the, the bands have changed. They they've made different uh, 
uh, agreements on, or there's new rules on what frequencies to use and doing this and that. I would have to study uh, myself, so I don't even I don't even know if I could pass it without doing some studying. Um, right. I'm good at the te- technical side, but I don't. Uh, it's, it has changed so much, and in many cases for the better because the the equipment is uh, more reliable nowadays, all solid state, computerized. Uh, you don't have to worry about being uh, off frequency or anything like that. It's things are highly right. calibrated. No uh, big-time transmitter adjustments. Unless you have a big power amplifier with a tube, you don't have to do any power uh, you know, tuning uh, or anything for the power amplifier section of most of these radios. And it's just simplified. So they were able to simplify the requirements, the entry requirements, dramatically. And it's so much easier now. The tests are much easier. You still have to study. There's a lot of information to learn. And, but I think almost anybody could pass it if they just gave it some effort for a few weeks. Okay, Tom, we'll be back in about three minutes, folks. 1-800-313-9443. Give us a call. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. Tired of being lied to by mass media? It's growing more and more apparent today that news is received less and less through standard media outlets. Even with a growing audience every day, RBN is beginning to direct more efforts into social media. Social media and the use of the Internet is fast becoming the primary source of people for news, regardless of demographic. RBN has set out to provide some of the best news on the Internet through republicbroadcasting.org and also has begun to use the tools to our advantage by way of social media. Republic Broadcasting is now operating a Facebook page to function as yet another avenue to have our collective voice reach new audiences across not only America, but across the globe as well. The Facebook page features not only news, but also an RBN player to listen to our broadcast. Get involved by visiting Facebook.com slash Republic Broadcasting and liking our page and share it with your friends and family, because you can handle the truth. back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tim Spencer sitting in for John Moore on Friday, the 13th day of December, year of our Lord, 2019. Right now, we're talking with Mr. Tom Burial about ham radio communications. Uh, Tom, I want to go a different direction if it's okay with you. Uh, maybe we have some no- new listeners. Can we spend just a couple of minutes on why it's so important for people to have ham radio skills and have access to a ham radio. Uh, I know the answer to these questions, but I'm thinking uh, many of our new listeners might not. Well, that's a good thing to talk about, Tim, because uh, in the event of an all-out emergency, our grid down, power's out, telephones don't work, cell phones don't work, ham radio equipment will get through. Um, there's been situations where uh, bad storms came in, hurricanes and so on. Police departments could not even communicate, but the ham radio operators could because part of the part of the training that you'll receive by being involved in this in this uh, hobby, it is a hobby. It's, uh, you can't do any kind of ham radio operating uh, for hire. You can't make money off of it. Now, you can set by and sell equipment if you want to, but you can't get on the air and charge somebody to transmit messages for them or, or use it to on the air to, uh, as a broadcasting system or anything like that where you'd make money. But for, just for hobby communications, and some of it gets pretty serious when there's, uh, when there's outages like that during storms. These guys, uh, men and women that are on the air, they 
they go into high gear, Tim, and they provide emergency oh, communications when the systems are out. Look at any hurricane situation. I've listened to them, and it's uh, it's amazing. So, uh, you know, the amount of traffic that they they pass, they'll they'll have networks, and and you can check in and then uh, announce your location. If there's any traffic for your area, they'll ask you to move off to another frequency. You'll handle that traffic and get that information through to the people that are trying to uh, get in touch with their friends and family that may be in the affected area. So it's really good for that, and you'll learn those skills once you get your ham radio license and get on the air and start talking to people, join a ham radio club in your local area. You'll have a chance to learn all about this and per- perhaps even participate um, in one of these situations where the your communications is totally out and you're the only way for people to get messages through. It's uh, With satellite yeah. systems, I don't think the ham thing is... Is um, you know it's it's important, but not as important. But uh, if, the, if they have satellite communications, that usually takes care of everything. But there's still uh, ham oper- ham operators are still asked to participate and help uh, with all of this. So it's it's a good thing. It really is. In the old days, it was sometimes the only way to communicate. Right. Um, over long ranges, especially under emergency situations. You know, Tom, uh, Lori and I and our kids, of course, went through Hurricane Hugo in South Carolina in 1989. I couldn't leave because I was in the Navy. Lori couldn't leave because she was a firefighter. But anyway, what happened was after that hurricane hit, they used a ham radio, a civil defense ham radio, I actually was in the room and saw it, uh, to talk to Jacksonville, Florida, where the FCC allowed a AM station there to bump up its power. I don't remember what it was. I know it was over 100,000 watts so that people could get the official word from the South Carolina state government and county governments on their radios because there wasn't a single working radio commercial radio transmitter within I would say 150 miles of where that hurricane hit so that was one example all right Tom we have a caller we've got Mark in Virginia online pretty good morning Mark yeah I don't know if you can hear me because I'm on Bluetooth and I'm driving so yeah I can hear you Okay, so I recently bought uh, a piece of equipment, and I realized that it's not, it probably isn't even a ham radio, and I'm just wondering what my limitations of this is. I don't have it with me. It's a Czechless, I think it's a Czech Republic field radio, military field radio. It's a small radio. Um, it, I got to get the battery rebuilt on it, but basically it's almost like a, um, it's like a 1970s model. It's kind of like a post trick kind of field radio, but it's before the Sin Guards. And I, I don't know if it's, I can't remember if it's UHF or VHF. I picked it up for $150 at a surplus store, and it didn't it didn't work because the batteries were dead, so I'm going to have to take it to, like, Batteries Plus, get the batteries rebuilt, the battery box. And then I'm just wondering, um, you know, it's it's a small radio. What, what, what my limitations of and what the best outcome of any kind of uh, usability I'm going to be able to give in this thing. Well, a lot of the ham operators uh, are taking military equipment like that and using that that equipment on the ham radio bands. You can do that if it covers that particular frequency range. A lot of those uh, portable and backpack radios that operated in the HF spectrum, they were they were single sideband and, and Morse code, CW, which would be Morse code, and some of them would have AM as well. Um, they're used all the time. I've actually talked to guys that were using those things while they were actually out in the field, and it, it was amazing how well they work. I don't know what you have without model numbers and that, but it's most of them uh, for short in short range work were VHF, so it could be 30 to uh, 76 megahertz. I think a lot of them operated in those ranges. That's a low band FM. Some of them operated higher, but the majority of them operated 
between 30 and 75 or 76 megahertz, somewhere in that range. Now, that would cover the 6-meter ham band, so you could use it there. And they're usually FM. They're not single sideband. They're usually FM, especially it was made in the 1970s. It's most likely FM. is probably a low-band unit. I'm guessing, but by looking at it, I, you know, I could tell you, but right now we're just guessing. A lot of those backpack units were, uh, were FM in the, uh, in the low band uh, VHF spectrum. Okay, well, I mean, I, like I said, I haven't even been able to, you know, actually use it because i got to get the battery rebuilt. And for $150, I was like, you know what, I took a chance. I was like, well, I'll buy it. I'll take a chance, get the battery rebuilt, and see what this thing can do. But I was just, I know it's not, I know I can receive a longer distance, but I ain't going to be able to push out very far. But I'm just wondering, like, um, you know, what kind of, uh, I guess, I, I, I guess maybe I would need a license for it, but I just, I'm not there yet. I'm, I don't have the time to do any of that yet. So, anyway. Thank yeah, you, you would need a lot, you would need a license. You would, you would require a license to use that. And if you've got a ham radio license, the only, most likely if that's a low band unit, it will cover the six meter band. You could use it there. If you used it on the frequencies out, and the six meter band is 50 to 54 megahertz. So anything outside of that, um, you would not be able to get a license to use it. It, it would be in the land mobile, uh, Spectrum, but those things are wide band, being from the right. 70s, so it wouldn't meet uh, today's standards. So it would not be allowed to be licensed for land mobile uh, use. And I don't think I would take a chance with that. Okay, and, and then one other thing. I mean, it seems like everything on this thing—it's it's all built in, all internal. Um, I don't, I don't. Aside from just turning the knobs with a preset. Um, Frequencies, you know, I, I don't know if like uh, I, I don't know if I would need a bunch of testing equipment and all. I mean, it's, it's already going to be preset, right? You know, some of the military equipment, the newer stuff, has built-in test equipment. When you first turn it on, right. it goes through a boot-up routine, and it ha actually has a screen that tells you that all the systems are operating properly. So. Now, it doesn't diagnose any problem, but it will tell you that if a certain function isn't operating properly, it'll give you an, an error indication for that particular function, and you can take it to the radio shop and they'll repair it there. A lot of them are modular. When you open, open up the cabinet or the case that it's in, the uh, circuit modules will unplug, so you can have test equipment or, or fixtures that they plug into to actually service them and work on the work on the modules it's uh, it gets a little complex if you're trying to do it without there's always a lot of specialized fixtures and extender boards and things to to make the servicing easy for that particular radio so if you worked on a whole fleet of those it'd be wise to have that equipment sometimes you can rig up something to do it yourself uh, for your own uh, units and that's what I would do unless I have access to the to the actual test equipment and fixtures required for alignment and testing. Most likely the thing works fine. It's possible it was just taken out of service. You just need the battery. A lot of times the batteries, they won't hold a charge anymore. And being the military, they just throw it in the surplus pile and they put a new one in service and they, they sell the other stuff off of scrap. Yeah. You know, Tom, back in the 70s, they would have used crystals, would they not? Or am I wrong on that? Well, even a, a, lot, of the, a lot of those backpack units were actually tunable. Some of them, they may have had crystals in a transmitter, perhaps, but a lot of them were actually tunable, and they were, the bandwidth was wide enough. There were wide band transmissions where the frequency stability wasn't that critical. And then uh, getting to okay. the Vietnam... Yeah, getting into Vietnam era, they, those radios were synthesized, and you could just dial in the frequencies you wanted. And then, uh, so starting in the in the 60s, and then all the way up to uh, into the 70s, and the equipment made today is is very sophisticated. They have frequency hopping. Oh yeah, uh, it's all co it's all computerized, and it's, um, it's some pretty good stuff. And very expensive, by the way. I see them on 
eBay once in a while. There, there's one, that, a real nice one that came up made in Australia. It was a relatively late model unit that looked really good, a few little scratches on it. It sold for $3,000 or, or $3,900. Oh, wow. Something like that. It didn't last 24 hours. I, I really debated about buying that thing myself. But see, I'm interested in the portable operation for emergency use, and that's on HF equipment, Tim. And one of the things I'm working on now are these uh, protective cases where you could take regular ham equipment and combine it with a battery bank, uh, antenna coupler, antenna tuner, and everything you need to have a portable system all in one case. So I'm just making the case that will house these popular radios, and I'm I'm working out the uh, working on the molds to make the plastic parts and everything to do this. So that, that's the right. product I'm, I'm working on right now. Excellent. Okay, uh, Mark, did uh, Tom answer your question sufficiently, or do you have, have more questions, sir? Well, that's probably about it. I mean, I'm, I'm just hoping that for $150, I mean, that's what it goes on. I guess you could buy it on eBay or something like that. Um and, and it's supposedly for 1970s technology. It was supposed to be ahead of its time. I looked a little bit up of it on, you know, information up on it. But like I said, I don't have, I don't have it with me. It's, it's back home. I'm, I'm out truck driving right now. So, and I was just for hundred right. dollars. I, I figured, yeah. All right. So thanks. You're most welcome, Mark. Call back any time, ladies and gentlemen. The call-in number is one eight hundred three one three. 9443 if you have any questions about ham radio or antennas or anything like that for Tom give us a call okay Tom uh, I did you catch the country of origin uh, that Mark and Virginia was talking about on that radio well he said Czech Republic and that's what I thought I've seen some of those units out there uh, and I kind of, kind of think I know which one it is, but and it's okay. most likely low low band FM. It's maybe two or three watts of power. They're very low power. They don't they don't uh, transmit with a lot of power, and it's for for short range point to point communications. They work quite well, though. If you can get it working, if it's probably just the battery bank that's no good, and he can rebuild that with some newer type battery cells and put that thing right. back on the air. It's yeah, I'm on thinking the meter, same six thing. Six-meter FM. And, you know, the Soviets built most of their uh, field equipment like tanks. You know, I'm not saying that the technology was super great, but, I mean, they built them like tanks. So the few Soviet-era radios I've seen uh, from Eastern Europe, I mean, it looks like you could take a sledgehammer to them, and they'll still work. Yes, that's true. And... They had to be very, very rugged, built to military specs. And, Tim, uh, some of the military equipment is fun to work with. Some of the HF oh, yeah. equipment, I've, ta I've talked to guys on the air, and they're using those things. There's a, whole, there's a whole group of ham operators that are interested in that type of equipment. But they'll also tell you it's rather cumbersome to use it on the air because you've got to dial in each little uh, channel segment, whereas the ham right. operators are used to just turning a knob and dialing the frequency real quickly, these things are a little bit difficult to tune around. Now, if you're going to a specific frequency, you're going to be right there, and that's the network you want to be on, it's fine. They're very stable, and they work well, but um, if you want to just use it for general purpose communications, it wouldn't be my first choice, but they are kind of, kind of interesting to use out in the field, that's for sure. I bet they are. Now, I've never used one or tried to, but I'd, I'd like to watch it done or try to use one. I, I've got a feeling it'd be interesting. Of course, you know, being a cold warrior, you know, all that time period really interests me. Um, well, the reason, the, but you know, I, I'm interested in those radios as well, and I, I had a customer when I manufactured multi-layer printed circuits. I did a little, not a lot, but a little bit of work for R.F. Harris there in Rochester, New York. I know exactly and, the company. Yep. 
and they make some first-class equipment. I mean, top-notch stuff. They make all kinds, but they make the backpack radios. Some of the some of their equipment is is being used right now um, yep. in the Middle East, used all over the world, as a matter of fact. But the, it's some real high-end equipment. When it shows up on eBay, it doesn't last long for any amount of money. That stuff is they're purchased quickly. I have no idea what they cost new. But they're very expensive. Well, I agree. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in three minutes. 1-800-313-9443. This is the John Moore Show. I am Tim Spencer, sitting in for John Moore right now. We're visiting uh, with Tom Berryhill, and we're talking about ham radio. Uh, Tom, for this hour, we only got about, uh, looks like, five minutes left. Any uh, message you want to get out to folks? Well, I... We talk about emergency communications. We've been talking about test equipment today, uh, the requirements that, you know, what you need to get, the books in that from American Radio Relay League to start your studying. To get the license, you need to find a, a ham radio club in your area. They usually are the ones that have the volunteer examiners that administer the test. And that's what you do. Right. It's pretty simple. And you have to put some effort into it, study for three weeks, maybe a month. And you'll be able to uh, take the online test and see how you're progressing with your uh, knowledge on the subject. And you'll get to the point where you're passing those tests every time you take them online. At that point, you're ready to go. Uh, Go to the next next, uh, testing session at the Ham Radio Club. It's a relaxed atmosphere. You don't have to go to the FCC office at a federal building like in the old days. That was very intimidating. But now it's, it's a relaxed setting classroom type setting and they will administer the test and you'll find out you passed it right then and then they send those all that paperwork into the FCC and you'll have a call sign issued usually within a week or so it goes pretty fast right not like the old days where it could take a couple of months it's pretty uh, simple uh, relative to the old days that the uh, requirements are relaxed quite a bit so I really think anybody with a little bit of effort could get into it and then, of course, we talk about emergency communications. So I would like to talk about portable equipment, field operations, and we talked a little bit about that. Um, but you'll, at a minimum, even if you don't get a ham license, you really should get a scanner, a VHF and UHF scanner that's capable of digital transmissions, such as P25 and DMR-type digital transmissions that are used by law enforcement. Some of that's encrypted. If those transmissions are encrypted, you're out of luck. You're not going to hear them. It'll be garbled. But a lot of that information will be available, and almost all of those agencies have gone to digital uh, with mostly P25 digital. And you'll be able to get a scanner to hear them. You'll know what's going on in your local area. And then, very important, I I feel it's most important, is to get a shortwave radio one that's good enough that has single sideband capabilities. If you can listen to single sideband transmissions, you'll hear all the ham operators on the uh, shortwave spectrum. You'll hear ham operators from all over the country, all over the world. You can also listen to uh, broadcasts from shortwave stations. And sometimes, Tim, the best information comes from outside your own country. So You're not why, kidding, buddy. Yep. They, they don't have the filters that they're going to have on domestic transmissions. You know, they may be prohibited from speaking about certain subjects, whereas the foreign station, it might only be uh, Mexico. It might be South America. It might be Europe. They'll just tell it like it is, and you'll be able to listen to all of that. Uh, crystal You're clear. You're absolutely correct. 
And, of course, the single sideband allows you to listen to the ham operator. It's very important to have that single sideband capability. All right, Tom, we got to wrap it up. Thank you, my friend. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back next hour, uh, hopefully with Dr. Wilbur. Uh, we'll do the best we can. The Green Beret. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second hour of the John Moore Show on this, a Friday, the 13th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2019. Uh, Last hour was incredibly interesting with Tom Berryhill. We're getting ready to have another great hour. We're going to be talking to Dr. Lynn Wilbur. Good morning, Doc. Greetings, Tim Spencer. The honor and the pleasure to be here. So, I don't know where what you've been covering with John for the past few weeks. I don't know where you want to go. Uh, I'm here to facilitate. So, take it away, Doc. Well, one of the things that I'd love to talk about this time of year is, from a statistical standpoint, and it's it's pretty much the same for a number of years. I don't know how far back it goes, but the number one reason why people die in this country is from heart attack. Still. Right. Heart attack is totally preventable. Even with the congenital condition, in order for you to have the conditions that you, quote-unquote, inherited from your ancestors, you still would have to create the environment in order for that particular condition to exist. So you would have to do and live the same way that your ancestors did to get the same thing. So it, 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 if it's inherited, then it's questionable. However, we're rounding out a decade. This is the last month of the decade. We're getting ready to go into a new decade. Remember when we were going from uh, 1999 to 2000 and everybody just didn't know what to do. And it turned out it wasn't that big a deal. (laughs) But we perceived it as so. Well, that's what happens the week between Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. That week, is the number one time period where people die from heart attack. Right. When I when I observe that, I'm going, well, why is that? I'm the why guy. I'm always wanting to know why. Why is it that when I turn this light switch on, the light comes on, and when I turn it off, it goes off every time. Why does that happen? I think it sparked my early interest in electricity. Right. So why is it that we accumulate so much stress during this time period when the opposite is actually true? The opposite is true. This is the time period where people are going, uh, let's be thankful. Or what day are you not thankful? Why do you need one day to specifically focus on thankfulness? How about we extend that to 365 and a quarter days a year? You know, Doc, I want to inject something here, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, No. You know, I noticed it's not only one day a year to be grateful. People choose one or two days a year, like Thanksgiving or Christmas, to be charitable. I work for a nonprofit, and that was one of their big things, was give everybody a free meal on Thanksgiving or Christmas. My constant question was, what about the other 364 <laughs> days a year? Uh, exactly. I, I made some enemies by saying that. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, and what happens is the majority of the masses, majority of the masses are at least in the celebratory uh, mindset around this time of the year. But then look at the flip side. It's the accumulation of stress. See, stress is neither good nor bad. 
Right. Stress is neither good nor bad. Stress is necessary in order for you to continue to live. I, think I use the example, if I took a strapping young 21-year-old lad and put him in an observatory situation in a hospital room and had him lay down for 30 days, you don't have to get up to use the bathroom, uh, to eat, to, to personal hygiene, all of that's taken care of for you. But you can't get up out of the bed. You have to be in a recumbent position for 30 days. At the end of the 30 days, this lad will have to take another 30 days, if not 60 days, to learn how to walk. Right. And so walking and movement is tied into emotions. There's a part of the brain called the limbic system, not the limbo system, the limbic system where all of your thoughts and feelings and emotions and attitudes and beliefs about everything that you've ever had in life, and it accumulates over the moments that you've lived up to the right. time when you're right. still living. It's, it's all the same moment. It's not a linear time period with your healing system or your subconscious. Your subconscious does not know linear time. It's only vertical time. So you may not know that this picture screen, this giant Omnimax Dolby surround sound picture screen is playing in the background an experience that you wish you had skipped over. And you don't know that it's playing until you become aware. Here's a perfect example. You're driving down the street and sun shining and, you know, beautiful scenery and your mind just drifts off a little bit. You're not really paying attention to the phenomena. And all of a sudden, whoop, 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 whoop. oh, no, oh, no. And then your heart changes rhythm. You may even have yeah. a bit of anxiety because now you're anticipating the uh, conversation with the friendly police officer, and you know all of your, your, your registration and all that stuff is in the glove box. And so you pull over, and, and he goes right by you. He's chasing someone else. Right. Well, it's too, it's too late. You perceived, you perceived that you were going to have a friendly conversation with the officer, and you went into fight or flight emergency mode over something that didn't happen, something that you imagined hey. was going to happen. So... Your subconscious looks at things that you imagine. It looks at things that you think about. And it also considers reality, your perception of reality. So what is reality? Reality is merely an interpretation of one's environment by way of five senses. And so if your interpretation is a bit distorted, then so will be your reality. And again, another example. Hey, Doc. Is, there, Doc. There, yes. Let me let me interrupt you for just a second. Uh, if this is who I think it is, it's my co-host uh, for tomorrow's show, Rick in Missouri on line. Good morning, Rick. Uh, good morning, Tim. Good morning, Doc. How are you doing? Fabulous yourself. Oh well, yeah, fine. I don't normally tell medical stories about myself. Uh, Unless it pertains to everyone else. So, so I will tell you, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, diverge from the program for just one second, and then I have something to say about your brain and electricity, my brain and electricity. Um, hey, Tim, you remember those pictures I sent you at the door we were stripping last Wednesday, a couple days ago? Yes, yes, yeah. Well, Looks like well, you did a beautiful well, job. What? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I want the money. Uh, so... Uh, so, uh, I wasn't wearing safety glasses. Uh, I ran the, we use aircraft stripper because it's the most powerful thing we can find in time's money. Ran the stripper brush across the doorknob open hole and it flipped stripper in my eye. Mm. And, uh, I dropped the brush and did a backflip. Uh, uh, crawled across I bet the floor you as I, oh man, uh, I'll tell you what, you can't get, you can't get either eye open when you're in that sort of pain. 
which brings me to another point. Pepper spray is a waste of time. If you want to get rid of somebody, um, spray that on them. Um, the, uh, <laughs> tried to get the water going, but it was one of those thermal deals, and I was wearing nitro gloves, so that wouldn't work. Real, real quick, as fast as I could, reach for my handkerchief, and I did it with such force I tore the back of my pants out. So now, now, there's this, there's this guy in the john stumbling around, drooling on his shoes, blind, with his butt hanging out. So how am I doing? Oh, I'm fabulous. Uh, I'm going to go get another, yeah, my left eye still Rick, hurts. I'm sorry, I, I know it hurt, but that was funny. Oh, man, you, you talk, and yeah, and you know, you got, you got that breeze at your back uh, the rest of the day to remind you that you should have had uh, safety glasses on. Uh, you know the old, uh, you know the old saying: "May the wind at your back always be your own." Um, and, well, and for me, it was not. Hey, um, you know, I've been promising for a few days, for a few weeks, to talk about meditation. I never seem to get to that, uh, which kind of reminds me a little of today's show. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow. But in the meantime, I was going to give everybody a little bit of homework here. Um, there is an, a fascinating YouTube out there, and Doc, I'm not, not taking over your show. I'll be done in one minute. Um, fascinating YouTube out there uh, called um, Why Why Meditate? No, Why, yeah, Why Meditate? Sh- uh, change Your Brain's Default. And um, it's about meditation, but it's also the story opens with a gal named Sally Addy, who... Uh, was a journalist, but she was going to go into the combat thing. I guess she was going to be a combat journalist, which I frankly don't understand. So they put her through a sniper assault training course where she panicked because of the uh, the uh, number of enemy coming, kept jamming a rifle, and et cetera. Uh, soon after that, they actually got in a live fire fight um, where uh, she calmly got down on her stomach and started shooting assailants uh, one after the other. These were armed, armed men, black masks, I assume that means Muslim, uh, with explosives and rifles. Uh, she killed all 20 of them. There were 20, and she killed them all. And when she got up, she asked everybody, uh, how many did I get? And they said, you got everybody. And um, she thought that the firefight lasted a few seconds, but it lasted 20 minutes. And she went into a mental condition called flow, which you'll see uh, when uh, surgeons can do it or bobsled racers can do it, where everything slows to a standstill, and you seem to have an advantage. Uh, yeah, they have, they fitted her with a, with a helmet that has a, uh, an electronic signal flowing through it, and it is a it is a, it's a stimulator. It's, it was wiring in the helmet that mimics. A meditative state. So she was able to give her complete undivided attention to the fight and was madly successful. Um, so, and they did that with a mild electrical current stimulating her brain uh, to, to mimic meditation. Um, Doc, what? Wow. Uh, sorry to take up so much of your time, but uh, you were talking about your fascination with electricity. Um, I'm thinking about going 220 or 221, whatever it takes. Uh, what do you uh, think uh, about the uh, about this? The electrical stimulation part, Rick. Yeah, 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 yeah. The uh, the uh, yeah the uh, yeah the, uh, yeah, the, the, the function of it all or meditation. I don't care which. Oh, okay. What you think, Doc? That's quite fascinating. Oh, very fascinating. Yeah, well, you can look up that video. I bet you'll get a kick out of that. It's only 14 Um, minutes. It's only 14 minutes. Doesn't take much time. Again, the part of your brain that you are affecting when you quiet your conscious mind is the subconscious. There's conscious and there's subconscious. So if she were to perceive her environment as a threat, which it was, if somebody's trying to kill you, that's a threat to your life. 
That Pretty is much. a sympathetic response. And so either you had to be trained in some sort of Zen meditation, right. or in, th- in this case, it was the, the meditative state was pr- provided by, and I haven't seen the YouTube video, I'm just going on what you just said. The meditative oh, you're gonna state was, <coughs> was right. simulated with this device that created right. a frequency that created a frequency that allowed the brain to go in the, in the, to a meditative, calm, laser-focused right. state where time right. doesn't exist. You mentioned flow. She was in the flow. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, if you don't put your time in, you can't pick it out the air. She had to have training. She had to have simulated something along those lines in order for her to go from from what she learned in training to implementation under fire and literally under fire in autopilot. And so right. when we go into a meditative state, and I've, I've been doing a, a lot of research on yoga. I find yoga to be fascinating. And one of the definitions in yoga, it says yoga is stretching your body, breathing, focusing on positive things, this concentrated, focused effort of focusing on conscious focus on positive things, and and here's the kicker, relaxation and meditation. I'm right. going, why isn't everyone doing yoga? Because it, well, it's been marketed as something different than what it is. Yoga has oh, been yeah. It's not a century. century. People want to take and connect that to a religion, but it is not a religion any more than uh, not. push-ups or is a religion. Yeah. It's not. It's push-ups for your brain, but it's not a religion. You can be any religion and do this. Exactly. Oh, and since you mentioned it, I have a YouTube channel, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Yeah, since we get back, Doc, 1-800-313-9443. Give us a call, folks. Tired of being lied to by mass media? It's growing more and more apparent today that news is received less and less through standard media outlets. Even with a growing audience every day, RBN is beginning to direct more efforts into social media. Social media and the use of the Internet is fast becoming the primary source of people for news, regardless of demographic. RBN has set out to provide some of the best news on the Internet through republicbroadcasting.org and also has begun to use the tools to our advantage by way of social media. Public Broadcasting is now operating a Facebook page to function as yet another avenue to have our collective voice reach new audiences across not only America, but across the globe as well. The Facebook page features not only news, but also an RBN player to listen to our broadcast. Get involved by visiting Facebook.com slash Republic Broadcasting and liking our page and share it with your friends and family because you can handle the truth. Sitting in for John Moore on Friday, the 13th day of December, New Year of Our Word, 2019. Right now, we're talking with Dr. Lynn Wilbert and Rick Schmidt. Uh, that is, if Rick's still there. Are you still there, Rick? No? Yeah, Guess yeah, I am. Drop. Yeah. Oh, no, Rick, Rick is here. How do you All do? All right, uh, gentlemen, go ahead. And don't worry, Dr. Wilbert, wanted... we'll get in your website and YouTube channel and all that here in a minute. Yeah, no, I just wanted to let Doc finish his response there. That's all. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, since you're mentioning YouTube, there's um, a commercial that was 
filmed and, and, and several different scenarios with Ella Fitzgerald. Ella Fitzgerald mm. is a jazz thing that can do amazing things with a voice. She can hit um, an octave <clears throat> on the sound scale, and that octave would be so high that the molecules that are clinging together, known as glass in a goblet, they shatter. So here Ella Fitzgerald's in a sound booth, and she's doing this uh, amazing voice gymnastics called scatting. And she hits this note just way up there in the goblet because it obeys the laws of physics. It doesn't think. It doesn't have a choice. The goblet say, hey, we can't hang out with octaves this high. We have to disband. And the goblet breaks. Now, they remove the broken glass, bring in another goblet. Does the goblet think? No, it merely responds to universal law. And so the goblet did not know that there's a recording device in the sound booth, and so they hit rewind, play. And when they hit play, it was a recording of Ella's live voice. And as soon as they hit that octave where glass molecules cannot no longer bind together, that goblet did the same thing. Did it know that it was a recording? So here's the tagline. It was Memorex. Is it live or is it Memorex? I remember goblet, that. Yes. The goblet did not know that it was a recording of Ella's voice. However, it responded to the law. It, and if it had been done 1,000 times, the goblet would have broken 1,000 times. That's universal law. That's physics. Resistance to the right. law is futile. It is futile. You will exhaust the physical body resisting the laws of creation. <clears throat> and so with that being said, the part of your system, your subconscious, that knows how many red blood cells you've got right now. There's only a 120-day cycle of red blood cells. That means you have to recycle the ones that are at the 120-day cycle. You have to have some in the hamper, in, in the in incubator. You have to have some incubating in the spleen, and the liver's got to keep. Who's keeping track of that? Your subconscious. Your subconscious knows your calcium level, your blood sugar level, your blood pressure, your subconscious knows everything that's going on in your body, and its only response is to respond perfectly. Listen carefully to that statement. It responds perfectly to your perception of the environment. And so here we have five people that saw an accident, and you have five different stories because the perception was different. Just because there's a perception of anger from another person external to you, it does not mean that you have to respond in kind with anger. There's a doctor, he's, a, he's an Englishman over in the U.K. His name is Dr. Alan Watkins, W-A-T-K-I-N-S. He's on YouTube as well. And renowned, he teaches CEOs across the world how to be brilliant every day. Now, I wouldn't want to be a CEO of a large, organ, large corporation, but we are all CEOs of ourselves. So when we look at ourselves as CEOs, chief executive officers, what do we do on a daily, moment-to-moment -moment basis? Do we relive experiences that we wish we had skipped over? I mean, that experience that just took your heart out, threw it on the ground, stomped on it, pummeled it, gave it back to you in that bruised condition, and you perceived that your heart was hurt. Well, first of all, everything I say is true because I've researched it. Secondarily, doesn't matter whether you believe it's true or not, just do some more research. The heart, the heart cannot be hurt. And since beliefs drive behavior, if you believe in disease, you will have one. If you believe you are sick, you will be sick. Beliefs drive behavior. I do not believe in the concept of disease. 
Disease implies that the body can do something wrong. Impossible. Remember those old typewriters with the the arm? You hit a key and the arm comes up, and if it was a T, it'd be a T on the paper. Well, you can't okay, get that. that got to break. Well, I got that. I got to go. I'll bounce. All right, thank you, Rick. Appreciate your call. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in three minutes. 1-800-313-9443. Give us a call. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. This is Tim Spencer sitting in for John Moore. This is Friday, the 13th day of December, in the year of our Lord, 2019. Here's uh, what the news is calling breaking news. It's no big surprise. Judiciary Committee Democrats approved two articles of impeachment against Donald Trump in just seven minutes, setting up historic vote of the full House on Wednesday and a Senate trial in January. And the charade and farce continues. Uh, okay, folks, I want to take this a moment to invite you to listen to the Rural Survival Show tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central, right here on RBN. Uh, if you're not familiar with the show, uh, give us a listen. We talk about everything from politics to gardens to religion to canning. Uh, we talk about it all. So we'd uh, would, uh Okay, uh, Doc, where do we want to go from here? There's a number of different directions, but let me stay on this vein of is it live or is it Memorex? Because okay. our, perceptions, our perceptions of our environment, which is external, our perception of the environment is going to determine the chemical balance of our internal environment. And the response is going to be perfect. The response is going to be perfect. The body cannot do anything wrong. We've been duped into believing it can do something wrong. But the only thing the body is, is a perfect messenger of the activity that's going on inside of the other three areas, your electromagnetic, your human electromagnetic energy field, your conscious mind, which is what you think with, and then your subconscious mind, which is more active when you're sleeping and healing and rejuvenating and repairing and revitalizing. Your subconscious goes to work when your conscious mind is silent. And that's kind of what meditation gets you to. Your conscious mind is focused on positivity. You're focusing on breath, which is really very important because if you stop breathing too long, you'll stop living. So oxygen is really very important. And in this day and age, right this moment, oxygen, the amount of oxygen that's in the air is down somewhere around 23%. That means there's 23% less oxygen available for you to inhale than it was 30 years ago. And there's no one on the planet that needs less oxygen. We need more oxygen. Sure. And so, and so here, here we are. We, we have a perception, and, and you mentioned as we came back from break, what's going on in, in politics. Well, from where we sit, there's nothing we can do about what's going on in Washington. And so why would we no. have those thoughts and emotions that are less than positive as opposed to, you know what? This will all come out in the wash, whatever they're spending their time doing. I just hope it's for the best for the country. And then you go about your business. But it doesn't do you any good to get emotionally upset about whatever's going on in Washington. If, if we as human beings knew the destructive devastation, the destructive, tornadic devastation 
that allowing ourselves to become upset, because nobody makes you upset, you allow, you perceive, and you choose, you judge and you choose to be upset if you knew the devastation that's caused inside your body from emotional upset, you spend the rest of your life learning how not to be emotionally upset ever again. That's how devastating it is. And we take upset for granted. Well, here's why it's not. Humans were not designed to handle the acid chemical residue from emotional upsetness, from less than positive feeling. Nature cannot choose to be upset. It's going to snow this weekend or early next week. The trees are not going to be complaining. If you look closely at the trees, they're already preparing for spring. They have little buds that's coming out getting right. ready for spring because they know what time it is. In three months, we'll be back on the job again. And th- three months ago, it was, it was Labor Day. That's how fast the time is going to go by. And it will because it's, I can't believe it's the end of the year already. So... Is it live or is it Memorex? Your subconscious cannot tell the difference between what is perceived and what is real. Now, here's the kicker. Back to Alan Watkins. He's on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and Google Alan, A-L-A-N, Watkins, W-A-T-K-I-N-S. And, again, he teaches um, coherence. Coherence is when your emotional state and your physiological state is calm and coherent. If there's discoherence, there's dissonance, which is the opposite of resonance. Like resonating, you're in the same vibe, right, so you're right. resonating together. Well, dissonance is the opposite of that. And since I know a little bit about electricity, I also use terms like impedance and resistance. See, if the signal that right. goes from your brain to your big toe was impeded, then that nerve signal, that electrical signal, would be either delayed or detoured, or in some cases it doesn't get there at all. That's called paralysis. Mm. Delayed is a restricted range of motion in a limb somewhere. Oh, really? Why is that? Because the signal hey, is distorted. Doc, let me interrupt you just a second. Sure. We, we've got a caller for you. We've got Mark yeah. in Virginia on line three. Good morning, Mark, again. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, I called in earlier about the radio. And the reason why I'm calling, and I, and I was off here and I didn't hear the whole thing, and I know who Alan Watt is. I've seen him probably like 10 years ago on YouTube. He's got the big bushy beard. But, Doc, the reason no, why I called him. is I wanted, yeah, huh? That wasn't him. He doesn't have a beard. Well, maybe he shaved it off. I'm pretty sure, yeah. He's got blue eyes. I think he's dark, dark, dark hair. But anyway, the reason why I called, um, you mentioned that there's 23% less oxygen in the atmosphere. And Correct. I, want, I wanted to ask where you got that figure from. And I understand you're a smart guy. I, oh. Trust me, I believe you. Oh, I've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Month. But the I reason why I'm asking, ahead. okay, the reason why I'm asking is I remember back in biology before a lot of this political correct junk science was going around a long time ago or that recently started, that the atmosphere has to maintain like 21 or maybe 22 or maybe 23, that might be that number, 23% oxygen in the atmosphere and if it was any more, if there was any more oxygen in the atmosphere, then you could light a match and the whole atmosphere would burn up and destroy itself. So there's always a balance. So what I'm getting at is when everybody's like, oh, we need less CO2, less CO2, it doesn't matter. It's always going to balance out. We don't need less CO2 because they just want to, you know, that's what plants, you know, exhale and then they, you know, or they inhale that to, to take out the oxygen. So there's... there's there, can, there always is a, an exact percentage of hydrogen versus oxygen versus nitrogen versus all the other gases, mm-hmm. and I'm just wondering if that 23% was kind of like uh, if that number was thrown out there and maybe you read it correctly, but the person that published it was wrong. 
And I'll take Lance off here. Thank you. I, I think the number is accurate because it's, it's going, it's getting less and less and less. It was more, it was more than 23%. I thought it was closer to 20 or 21. I don't remember the exact source, but we have what's called the information highway, the internet. And I guarantee you, you can find it if you Google it. Now, again, you can't believe everything you read on the internet, but I happen to know that there's less rainforest on the planet than it was 20 years ago. And with depletion of the rainforest, and incidentally, that's not popping up in the news anymore. You think they're doing less rainforest depletion? No, they're not. No, they're not. So that means there's more of it going on. There's more holes being poked in the ozone. And so there's less oxygen available for us across the globe. Forest fires all over the place. There are environmental factors that affect that affect the quality of the air we breathe. If I had to live in L.A., I wouldn't. That's how bad the air is there. And so um, back to Alan Watkins. And again, Mark, he may have had a beard. I, I've just known about him for about four years. But he wrote a book called Coherence. Have you ever heard anyone say, I was so upset I couldn't think straight? Well, that statement is true. Once you become just a little upset, there's no such thing as a little upset. You sit on the side of the pool and you stick your big toe in. Oh, I just got a little wet. Well, every cell knew that that toe was wet. So you didn't get a little wet and you either all in or all out. And so when you get a little upset, there's no such thing. Humans were not supposed to get emotionally upset. Trees cannot dictate what they think about creatures cannot dictate what they think about. They respond innately. I watched the movie The Penguins some time ago, and the female walked 70 miles in the tundra to get food for the, the, the husband and the little penguin that's being born. And then she turns around and walks 70 miles back in the coldest place on the planet in order to feed both of them. And then they do it again. You think they have a choice to move to Florida? No. No, they've been doing it for centuries. So we as creatures, we're the only creatures that can co-create our environment. There's an external environment and an internal environment, and we are creators of that. Man can live on the moon, can live in space stations, can live in trees, can live underwater, can live in a rock mass. You will never see a badger with his nest in a tree. Badgers don't live in trees. They can't because they're not designed to do so. But we can create our own environment. And so in, in, under the context of coherence, I was so upset I couldn't see straight. Oh, I was so mad I couldn't even eat. Well, that's true. Upsetness is running from the bear, and calm, meditative state is just the opposite. And so he's, he's uh, elaborating a little bit, and he says to the audience, he says, who here is good at math? And the guy raises his hand. Okay, you're good at math. Well, come on up. Calls the guy up, and he hooks up this uh, heart rate variability machine that, that can determine how functionally capable your heart is. And it was pretty steady state. It wasn't jumping all over the place. It was just pretty steady. He's calm. Nothing's affecting him. He says, okay, you're good at math. I want you to count backward. Count backward uh, from 100. No, no problem. I want you to count backward from 100 by threes. Oh, piece of cake. I can handle that too. 100, 97, 94. And then Dr. Watt, Watt can start interjecting random numbers. 24, 24. And you saw his heart rate variability had it on a big screen so everybody could see it. It went out of bounds. I thought you were good. Wow. Oh, I was just, no, it's showing us that you were out of control. And as soon as that happens, there's a disconnect, a degree of disconnect in the signal that goes from brain to body and body to brain. In fact, it's more important, it's more important that the message coming from the body to the brain is correct. That's called sensory. The brain takes that sensory information, interprets it, and then sends 
a message back to the body that's the motor message. And so if the body is sending a message to the brain that's incorrect or out of time, you're sitting there holding hands, your shoulders and ears are holding hands as if you're bench pressing and you're sitting in front of your computer. Well, that's a timing problem. That's a timing problem. Elevated blood pressure is a timing problem. If we got up and ran around the block three times, came back, sat down, checked blood pressure, everyone would be elevated. Most would recalibrate back to normal within some minutes. But if you don't recalibrate back to normal, that means you're still running in your mind. Is there any difference in your physiology? No. Is it live or is it Memorex? No. The number one there, oh, yes, it is. It's live or Memorex. There's no difference. The number one bear that chases human, the number one bear is emotional upsetness of any kind about anything. That is the number one bear in a human being's life. Now, we have systems designed to handle the asset of living. I'm just going to get into that just a little bit. All of our physiological functions produce acid. Like when we exhale, that's acid, that's CO2. Our urine is acid, bowel acid. Acid is eliminated from the body by buffering systems or neutralizing systems because too much acid in heart cells equal heart attack. Too much acid in a muscle cell is inflammation, myositis. Too much acid in the colon is inflammation in the colon. It's called colitis. And so wherever there's inflammation, there's an itis, arthritis, conjunctivitis, cholecystitis, inflamed gallbladders. And so every cell in the body can handle the acid of living, except the acid of stinking thinking is sometimes 24-7, and you overwhelm the normal healing systems. And at some point in time, you all of a sudden... Stop making blood pressure regulating drugs. Why? Because you've been running from the bear. You can't make healing drugs and run at the same time. Watch marathoners when they're running that 26.2 miles. They're not eating. They're not eating. They're replacing fluids. You can't eat and run. In fact, if you sit down at a meal, whether you're with someone or by yourself, and a thought crosses your mind, that doesn't make you feel good about anything at any time, because remember, the moment you were conceived is the same moment as now, and it's the same moment when you expire and your subconscious can't tell the difference. So it's an accumulation of moments. It's an accumulation of moments. So you accumulate this highly concentrated acid from stinking thinking. It would be like... Uh, the movie that came out a decade or so ago, Super Size Me, where you conduct an experiment and one eat McDonald's food, almost died during the experiment. Yeah, it was true. It was true. All right, Don't uh, what they tell you. <clears throat> we got a break. <laughs> Ladies and oh, gentlemen, we'll be back in three minutes, and then we're going to talk to John in Tennessee on line three, and we don't have the time for any more callers. Be right back, folks. Tired of being lied to by mass media? It's growing more and more apparent today that news is received less and less through standard media outlets. Even with a growing audience every day, RBN is beginning to direct more efforts into social media. Social media and the use of the Internet is fast becoming the primary source of people for news, regardless of demographic. RBN has set out to provide some of the best news on the Internet through republicbroadcasting.org and also has begun to use the tools to our advantage by way of social media. Republic Broadcasting is now operating a Facebook page to function as yet another avenue to have our collective voice reach new audiences across not only America, but across the globe as well. The Facebook page features not only news, but also an RBN player to listen to our broadcast. Get involved by visiting facebook.com slash republic broadcasting and liking our page and share it with your friends and family because you can handle the truth.
É o Authenticity in for John Moore on 13 December 2019. We have a caller, Doc. We're going to talk to uh, John, I believe it was. It's way up my screen. Yeah, John in Tennessee on line three. Good morning, John. Well, we're getting short on time, so I'll just make a couple quick comments and then listen to your response on the phone. Uh, okay. First of all, Doctor, um, and please don't take this as uh, criticism because I really don't mean it that way. But we all I have things that, that we way. do that I don't take it that way, John. <laughs> okay, let me get this in because it's pretty important. Um, we all do things that inadvertently hurt other people or cause pain. And as a result, we we think of ourselves or our actions if we if we got an empathetic personality or any kind of empathy, we have regret. So that's going to happen. Now, for someone not to have any empathy would be, I think, uh, abnormal. The other point I wanted to make, you made a comment that I have to address, where you said man can create his own environment. Well, I will agree that we can manipulate the environment to accommodate us. But we cannot, have not, and never will create anything because what we're using to create our environment or to create our uh, existence or to create our food are all things that have been there before we had any say, anything to do with it. The creator created the things that we're manipulating to provide what we want or need. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay, so we can't create our environment. And when it comes who down created, to it... Who, John, John, who created your living room? Who, cre who put the furniture in your living room and created the environment in your living room? You did. That was my point. Yes, those things well, that exist, but, but you put so them together. I'm manipulating, yeah. I'm manipulating my yeah. environment to give me a place yeah. to live. I can't... Doctor, right. I really cannot live in a tree. At some point, I must come down. I can't live there, under there water. Are. It's some... it, exactly. So, okay, exactly. exactly. So what you're saying to me appears like some kind of a, of a New Age Buddhism mixed with uh, some kind of uh, Hinduism mixed with some kind of meditation or, or you know, uh, Kundalini or something like that. Have you ever practiced Kundalini? That's your perception, John. I, I appreciate and acknowledge your perception, but nothing I speak about has anything to do with those things that you just mentioned. I'm a scientist. Well, it's I'm so, a it's so aggrandizement to me. Well, I'm that's a your perception. Too. That's your perception. That's, that's you are right entitled to your what... perception. The, the point I wanted to make, it doesn't matter what your perception is of the reality is that it is interpreted by your five senses and your five but senses. Reality is reality. Right? Gentlemen, reality. we're out of time. We're out of time. Right, exactly. Thank you for your call. It is live uh, as it Doc, thank you for being on. You're All right, welcome. ladies and gentlemen. Guys.